Now, live from Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill, it's the Aztec Coaches Show. Here's your host, Chris Ello. Let's hear it, everybody. We welcome you to the uh, Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill, the official sponsor for the Aztec Coaches Show with Rocky Long. I am Chris Ello, and of course, every Wednesday night, except for last Wednesday night when we had business to take care of at Air Force, uh, Hooley's is home to the famous corned beef tacos, other award-winning menu items. You know all of that. And Wednesdays throughout the season, Hooley's right here in Grossmont Center. We will have Coach Rocky Long on the air for the Aztec Football Coaches Show. We also thank our friends at Quality First Real Estate. San Diego's top real estate company. We can help you buy, sell, and manage San Diego real estate. When it comes to real estate, it is always Quality First. Click on uh, qualityfirstrealestate.com. Ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of the 4-2 and two San Diego State Aztecs, Mr. Rocky Long, coming off a very nice victory. I thought it was a very nice victory. I don't know about uh, you, Coach. Uh, you looked at the film and got the... Uh, a little more knee deep into it than we did, but uh, anytime you go into Air Force, you fall behind three different times in the football game. You're down uh, seven to three. You were down 14 to 10. You were down 20 to 17 in the second half. You come back each and every time, win on the road in a place where you've only won four times previously. That qualifies as a nice win, as far as I'm concerned. How? What do you think? Well, it seems like a better win now that you explained that. I didn't know we were behind that often. You know, you don't, when you're in the game, you don't realize that you're, I don't know, you know you're behind. I didn't know we went behind four different, did you say four different Three different times, times I think. Three, three different, different times, times yeah. Uh, I thought it was a very well-played game. I thought it was a very close game, and whenever it's close, you always have a chance to win. But I, I thought it was a, a big-time win. I, you know, with the short week and all that, I thought it was a big time win. 41 to 27 uh, was the final score for San Diego State over Air Force. And uh, you and I talked about it a little bit earlier this week. But yeah, that's right. Let's hear it. 41 to 27. You can go ahead and cheer, and scream, and yell a little bit. Even better off, come up with some questions for Coach Rocky Long in the second half of the show tonight because we have no game coming up this weekend. It is a bye week. So we're counting on some of you folks that are with us here at Hooley's for some questions for the coach uh, in the second half of our program. We'll be here for the next hour, but uh, I thought in a lot of ways you guys started building up to this win the way this season has gone along and the way you guys have played and shown toughness in the third and fourth quarters of your games. I mean, you played very well going back to the Washington State game in the fourth quarter. You played much better in the second half against Michigan than you did in the first half. I think you agreed you played better in the second half against TCU than you played in the first half. And then I thought you carried it right over to a game even at altitude against Air Force. And this game was going to be decided in the second half. It was 17 all at halftime. And I said to Ted on the broadcast, I said, whoever wins the second half obviously is going to win this game. I'm no genius, but San Diego State's been playing great in the second half this year, and you guys did again. Well, I, I think that's a tribute to the players. I, I, I think we get into games, and I, to be honest with you, I don't think we're getting a real good look in practice out of our scout teams. And so when you get into a game against the other team's first team, things move a little bit faster than we've seen in practice. And you have to have a lot of really mature players to be able to kick in right away. And we're playing a lot of young guys, especially on defense. Uh, and it takes us a while to get used to the speed of the game. And then obviously the other team has some things that they do to, uh, to attack our offense and to attack our defense that we haven't practiced against. And that, I mean, that's part of a coach's job is game planning, and they try to take advantage of some of our weaknesses. Uh, and it's a tribute to the players that we're able to make adjustments on the sidelines, we're able to make adjustments at halftime, and they're able to go out there and execute the adjustments in a, in a manner that allows us to play well in the second half. But I think it's all mental. I, th I think our kids think that they're tough, and I think our kids think that it, as long as we're in the game, we're going to win it in the second yeah. half. 24 to 10, you guys outscored them on the road at altitude at Air Force, and that's normally where Air Force wins their games. In the fourth quarter, they wear teams down, and that altitude is over 6,000 feet above sea level, for those who don't know. Uh, you get a little tired even broadcasting the game, probably walking the sidelines coaching the game too. I'm joking about that, but you're supposed to get a little tired playing the game. Obviously, you make a lot of changes and mix, uh, mix and match your defense throughout, try to keep everybody fresh. But still, there's been a whole bunch of teams that have gone up there, at least San Diego State teams that I've seen gone up there over the years, that no matter how many substitutions have been made, have gotten tired in the fourth quarter. So strength and conditioning, working out, off-season stuff. Did, I mean, did all of that come into play a little bit, you think, in the second half of that football game? Well, I have an attitude about that. 
and, and I think our players do too. I, I think they're in good condition. And nowadays with TV and radio, there, is, there are so many breaks during a game. I mean, I, I think there was five media breaks a quarter in the game against Air Force, which drives us nuts on the sideline, by the way. We would just as soon keep playing. But the first time I heard anybody even mention the attitude was tonight. Altitude, the altitude? altitude that was attitude. Right. Altitude was tonight. I mean, we don't talk about that. That's an excuse. That, that's a reason to get beat. Why would, why would you even talk about it? I mean, you've you got to play where you got to play. I mean, I, there was a famous uh, basketball coach that said one time you didn't have to worry about the altitude because they were playing indoors. Uh, <laughs> But, but I, I, think, I think if you make a big deal out of the altitude or you make a big deal out of your playing back in the eastern time zone or if you make a big deal that, guess what, we're playing, quote, quote, a BCS team, all of a sudden you're talking yourself into a reason to lose. I mean, we didn't, we didn't mention alt altitude one time to our team, and our team didn't say one time, Coach, I'm going to get tired. It's, you know, it's 6,000 feet up there at Air Force. Why would you say that? We're going to play a football game. They're a good football team. We think we're a pretty good football team. We'll see who the best football team is. It doesn't have anything to do with what grass you're playing on. It doesn't have anything to do with what stadium you're playing. It doesn't have anything to do except who plays better that night. That's and, all that matters. And you guys played better that night. I thought one key statistic, uh, in fact, the most important statistic, was the fact that you guys outrushed Air Force 201 to 195. Uh, a lot of you guys have probably been watching the Aztecs that are here at Hoolies tonight for a lot of years. Anybody remember the last time San Diego State played Air Force in football and outrushed Air Force? I mean, that's pretty difficult to do. They come into the game averaging 364 yards a game on the ground. You hold them to a buck 95, almost half their average. That's a tribute, again, to your kids and the way you guys coached them and played that night. And then, and then I think on the other side, your offensive line really started to take over that game because most of Ronnie Hillman's best runs really took place in the fourth quarter. And again, that's my going back to what I'm talking about, where it looked like you guys were getting stronger as the game was going on. I, I think that's true. I, I think we got stronger as the game went along, but I also think that uh, momentum is an amazing thing in a football game. And, and I thought we got the momentum on our side. I thought the biggest play in the game was when Rene Silawanu intercepted a pass in the second half. And I think that changed the momentum for the rest of the game because they were, they were moving the ball. They were close to scoring. It looked like they were going to score. They had us on our heels. They throw a pass. He makes a great interception. And from that moment on, I thought we dominated the game. You guys came back, kicked a field goal, tied it up 20-20. The next play, they fumbled on their first play. Jerome Long knocked the ball out. You guys recovered and then went right for the end zone with a little... Uh, a little play action pass that got Colin Lockett open. Now you're up 27 20. And then you guys turned in back to back three and out series. So your defense went interception, fumble, three and out, three and out in the third quarter there, late in the third quarter and on into the fourth quarter to help you take control of the game. Uh, part, part of that is their offense is built on staying on schedule. And they like to run the triple option, which means that you only have to average about four yards of play and you continue to get first downs and even if you only average three yards of play you fourth and one they always go for fourth and one and they make it about 99 percent of the time yeah so they like to stay on schedule but if you get a touchdown ahead or you can get them in second and ten or you have where they have to throw the ball now they throw it a whole lot better than they used to the quarterback's good they got a couple good receivers they used to not be able to throw it at all but they throw it a lot better now but if you can get a wishbone team to have to throw the ball on first down, you're going to win. Well, it turned out that way, and it was a great win. San Diego State goes to 4-2 and two heading into the bye week, uh, the long bye week. And that was very nice of them to work that into your contract, I think, this year, Coach, that if you go 4-2, and two, we'll give you 16 days off in the middle of the season. Very good negotiating done by your agent. Maybe you can, But you don't ever want to do it again, do you? Well, I, I, uh, secretly, I've, I've been complaining about the schedule because I don't know who made this schedule up. Anytime you have to go back to the Eastern time zone two times in your first four right there, games. That guy right there, Jeff Belitho, the marketing director at San Diego was State, it, I believe. Was, it, was yeah. it his fault? He made really? the schedule. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. so, yeah. No, I, I don't like the way the schedule's been set up. I, I, I like one bye week during it. 
because I think right near about midseason, if you get a bye week, that gives you an advantage to focus on the second half of the season, gives you an advantage to get well. 16 days is way too much. I'm afraid we're, you know, you come off that kind of win and you feel good about yourself and you feel confident about yourself, you just as soon play the next week. I yeah. promise you, you would. But it is what it is, and we'll see how we handle it. It is what it is. Let's real quick talk about your offense and its performance against Air Force. It was good to see Ryan Lindley come back with what I thought was a very efficient performance, 15 out of 21. That's only six incomplete passes. Maybe two or three of those were drops. Uh, he looked to be on the money, and he, I, didn't, I thought he played very relaxed, I, and I thought that could be a danger coming off of a couple of games that weren't up to par, that sometimes you're trying too hard to get everything back, and I didn't think Ryan looked, at least from where we were sitting, he didn't look that way. He looked very calm, cool, collected, and uh, you know, 15-21, couple of touchdowns, 209 yards, and then, of course, you got Ronnie going in the fourth quarter. Your offensive line started taking over the game, but... Talk about your offense's performance in this game against Air Force. I kind of thought your defense turned the tide, but your offense had to go out and win it after that. I, I thought the biggest key was the offensive line, and you already mentioned that. I, I thought the offensive line, uh, in my opinion, did not play very well against TCU. Now, you have to give TCU some of that credit because TCU is very athletic. They're very fast. They're good on defense. But I, I thought our offensive line could, should have played better against TCU, and, and I think they took that to heart. And I think they played a very good game against Air Force. And Air Force is a, a very tough, mentally tough, physically tough football team. And I think what you said was right. I think, first of all, they protected Ryan very well. I mean, there wasn't anybody close to him. Uh, second of all, the running game was working enough for play action pass to give our receivers a chance to make two or three cuts that would put them in an open position. And as you said, Ryan was hitting them on stride. I, I think it all starts up front. It starts up front on defense. It starts up front on offense. If, if you can handle the line of scrimmage, if you can make a stale, at least a stalemate at the line of scrimmage, now your skill guys determine if you're going to win or lose. If you don't hold your own or do well at the line of scrimmage, I don't care how good your skill guys are, you're not going to be able to win. So. The offensive line did a great job, and like you said, late in the game, I think they started dominating the line of scrimmage, which opened up bigger holes for a guy like Ronnie to make some big plays. And Ronnie did that, 172 yards rushing, a couple of touchdowns, and uh, both of those touchdown runs, long ones, in the fourth quarter. So congrats to Coach Rocky Long in the 4-2 and two start, a 41-27 victory at Air Force. Don't win there very often, folks, but that was a big one for San Diego State to go 4-2. and two heading into the bye week. We are live at Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill here in Grossmont Center. We will come back with more with the head coach of the San Diego State Aztecs. We are live on the radio, AM 600 Kogo. If you have a question for the coach, you're more than welcome to call in and join us at 569-8255. Also on the internet, we say hi to everybody who's watching. Scott's keeping the camera still. Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate that. And hi to everybody who's watching this around the world on the uh, Internet, all the Aztec fans. It is San Diego State football coach Rocky Long. We're back with more from Hoolies in just a moment on AM600 Kogo and Learfield Sports. Welcome back to the San Diego State Aztec football coaches show. Chris Sello along with the head coach of the Aztecs, Rocky Long from Hoolies Irish Pub and Grill. Of course, two locations out here in East County, not only right here in Grossmont Center where we do the coaches show every Wednesday night, but my hometown of Rancho San Diego. And of course, Hoolies has uh, great award-winning food, great draft and bottled beer selections, fantastic happy hour specials too. And we appreciate everybody. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. You guys are a little quieter out there tonight than normal. I, I, I get the feeling that, all right, it's, it's the midway point. Maybe everybody, the fans are taking, off, taking their bye week a little bit too. They realize there's no game coming up this weekend, coach. But uh, we like you guys rowdy out there. And uh, we love uh, Craig and all of the guys and gals here at Hoolies who take care of us each and every Wednesday night. Also want to remind you the tickets are still available for the Aztecs' next home game, which uh, will eventually come up, Coach, Saturday, October 29th against Wyoming. Tickets for the game start at only $11. Kickoff is at 7 o'clock. That is a week from Saturday, October the 29th. The Aztecs 4-2 and two, hosting Wyoming, which is also 4-2. and two. And uh, we'll talk quite a bit about them next week, Coach. But uh, there's a couple of teams. That's a Wyoming team that's much improved over a year ago. To purchase tickets, you can call 
SDSU or log on to goaztecs.com. I uh, hope you folks here at Hoolies are getting some questions lined up for the head coach of the Aztecs. We're going to open up the uh, next segment to all of you for some questions. Polly will walk around with the handheld microphone. So if you have anything at all you want to know from the coach, you're more than welcome to do that. One thing I wanted to ask you, we got a couple of minutes before the bottom of the hour, coach. You touched on the kids did a great job of making adjustments in, their, uh, in defending their run game in a victory last Thursday night over Air Force. And you've been so gracious to us during the course of the year in kind of detailing what adjustments are being made and things that you guys are doing. Can you take us through a little bit uh, of what you guys did a little, if you, you know, what differently was done against their option attack in the second half of that game? Because, uh, you know, you guys did a fantastic job defensively to win that football game. And you said there were some adjustments made. I think it's kind of fun when you give us a little chalkboard talk. I don't know how much you can tell us. Well, I, I mean, uh, I, I hope I can explain it well enough, you know, because sometimes I don't explain things very well. At least the players don't think I explain. You know, when I start yelling and screaming at them and tell them I've already told them that, they say, well, that's not the way you explained it the last time, you know. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, we went into the game where we were playing basically a two-deep defense. Number one, you have to, in my opinion, to stop the triple option, you, you have to try to eliminate the fullback. You have, to, you have to make the quarterback pitch the ball, and you have to keep the ball going sideways. Okay, as long as it's going sideways toward the uh, sidelines, it's not gaining yards. It's not going, the quickest way to the goal line is a straight line. So the, the fullback's going in a straight line. So if you let him go, he's getting to that end zone a lot quicker than if you make him pitch the ball and they have to run wide. Okay. Okay, so, so our idea was to make sure that the fullback didn't kill us. There are times that we allowed the fullback to run the ball, but try to keep the fullback from killing you. Try to, try to make sure the quarterback pitches the ball and try to keep the, the ball going sideways as long as possible. And then on the perimeter, if you show them a certain coverage, they have a couple ways to block the perimeter. So your guys that, and I said we were playing a lot of cover too early, which means we have a guy in the flat and we have a guy that's in a deep half at about 10 yards deep. Now they can block the guy that's in the flat, they can block him with the wide receiver and they can take a back as an arc blocker and go up on the safety. Now that's, those are both tough blocks. Those are one-on-one -on -one blocks, so the defensive backs have to defeat the block and be able to get to the pitch. So now it becomes a mono -a mono deal. They're two blockers against our two DBs when the pitch back has the ball behind their two blockers. Okay, the better way to block that, and Air Force is as good at it as anybody, is to push the guy in the flat back and then crack the safety that's coming down from 10 yards deep. It is very difficult for a safety to beat a crack back block. Crack back block being something that uh, you wait for him to charge forward, and then when he turns to try and make the tackle, you're standing there to right. crack back him right there. And it's an outside in block, so you have an angle on the safety. Their outside receiver has an angle on the safety. But he pushes the corner that's in the flat first and then cracks the safety. So the corner is late getting to the pitch so that the guy arcing out of the backfield has a good angle to kick the corner out. Okay. Okay, so now if they get both those blocks, you're counting on pursuit out of your inside guys to get to the sidelines and run them out of bounds. Okay, your guys that are pursuing the ball have to be faster than the guy that's getting the pitch. Tough to do. Which is tough to do. So, so the year before we did the same thing, and mano y mano, our DBs were better than their blockers, and we were making the tackle on the pitch. Last year, what killed us was the passing game and the fullback hurt us bad last year. Okay, so this year, I'm sure they anticipated it and they did a great job of coaching and their blockers were blocking our DBs better than our DBs were getting off the block. And so when they would pitch the ball, you'd see the pitch guy turn to the side and you'd see our pursuit coming, but the guy was getting five, six, seven, eight, nine yards on the pitch before they could get there before our pursuit could get over there and knock him out of bounds okay, okay. so what did you do to so uh real quick coach uh, what did you do to change it or try to slow it down in the second half and so in the second half we gave them a look of one coverage and rolled down into a different coverage that screwed up their blocking on the perimeter every <laughs> once in a while 
so that now all, all of a sudden the crack's not on the guy that he was thought he was supposed to be cracking. That guy had walked down close to the line of scrimmage. Now he can't crack him, so that guy can get to the guy blocking for the pitch a little sooner. And, and, and then every once in a while we'd stay back in too deep, so the, the two blockers were not exactly sure who they were blocking. So go. now all of a sudden the blocks weren't as good. There it is. There you go. All right, everybody get that? I got it. Very impressive. Thank you, Coach. Uh, that's the Aztecs attacking the Air Force option run last week, and that was a key to the victory, no question about it. We're at the bottom of the hour. We need a Kogo News update. Back with more the Aztec Football Coaches Show. Your questions for Coach Rocky Long when we return to Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill in Grossmont Center from Learfield Sports and AM 600, Kogo. Come on, people, let's go now. This is a second-half team this season. That means this has to be a second-half show. The Aztec Football Coaches Show, Chris Ello, along with the head coach of the Aztecs, Rocky Long. I want to remind you, if you are interested in buying, selling, or leasing a commercial property, Quality First Commercial, a full-service commercial real estate firm, visit our website, qualityfirstcommercial.com. QFC is there for all of your commercial real estate needs. All right, we've got some questions lined up. For Coach Rocky Long, we're going to uh, have Polly take the microphone through the crowd. But before that, listening uh, or actually watching online, you can wave hello there to Ken, who is in Phoenix. And he's also on the phone with a question for Coach Rocky Long. Ken, how are you? Welcome to the Aztec Coaches Show. I'm doing great. Congratulations, Coach. You're, you're doing a great, great job this year. Thank uh, you. A couple things if I could. I, I want to ask you what you think Wyoming's strengths are, their real strengths. And I heard a statistic on, not on the last game. The announcer was saying that San Diego State is the best second half defensive team in the country and I, I don't doubt that I think you just have done an incredible job with the defense and one other question like real quick uh when we go we win the rest of the games we beat Boise State here okay Sandy I go back for all the home games how is that going to work because if you say Boise State beats TCU and we lost against TCU and then we beat Boise State it'll be basically tied for the conference championship how does that work out in the long run as far as who makes that determination the conference well, that, that would be that would be fun though if it works out that way with you and Boise State and TCU. And he, I, what he's saying, I guess, is if Boise State would beat TCU, then you'd beat Boise State, and all three of you would have one loss. Who would be the conference champion? I know you'd be co-champions basically, and then uh, from there they would uh, take you guys for bowl games. I guess I, I I don't know that there's anything beyond that, is there? No, there's there's no way to determine a true champion. It'd be co-champions and. In the situation we are right now, nobody, if you have one loss, nobody would uh, uh, be in the BCS contention. So the bowl games get, I, I think they have an order that the bowl teams or the bowl games get to pick who they want out of right. our league. I think they go in order. So whoever they would pick, that's who Las Vegas go. Bowl, I think, normally gets the first selection, and then it goes to uh, maybe the Independence Bowl. The Poinsettia Bowl is there. Last year, of course, you guys ended up in the Poinsettia Bowl, but uh, let's hope you have that problem. Talking about your second-half defense, I, I don't know exactly where you rank statistically in the nation for second-half defense, but I do know that you've given up exactly one touchdown in the second half of each of your games this year. Uh, you'll probably smile a little bit more broadly the second half of the season if we can start saying no touchdowns in the second half of each game, but uh, seven points a game in the second half, that, that normally will help you get the job done pretty good. Yeah, I guess that means we're doing a good job of coaching in the second half and we're not doing <laughs> worth a darn in the first half. I so. knew he was going to say that somehow. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for the phone call. Appreciate you watching on the Internet in Phoenix. All right, Polly's got the microphone. Let's get some questions for the coach here at Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill. Yes, sir. Hi, Coach. It's Jim. Uh, question for you regarding your defense. Uh, your defense has been flying around the last two years, but especially this year, and hitting harder than on any defense that I can recall at San Diego State in years. And I think a, somewhat of a significant part of it is the kids that you've gotten out of Oceanside High School. Uh, are those kids doing that because they come out of a winning program like that, or is it a combination of you coaching and, and them coming out of a winning program? I, I think you never underestimate uh, the coaching that players get when they're younger. And uh, that could go all the way back to Pop Warner or youth football, and it obviously goes to high school football because we recruit out of the high schools. And there's a lot of coaches in this area that do a great job of coaching, but nobody does any better job of coaching than John Carroll does at Oceanside High School. Uh, he does a great job of coaching, so those kids come out of Oceanside and they know what football is all about. They have great fundamentals. 
And uh, I know John fairly well, not real well, but I'm, I'm sure that he develops their toughness mentally and physically. Um, a lot of it has to do with recruiting. You, you recruit kids when you watch them on film. You recruit kids that like to be tough. You recruit kids that like to hit. But I, but I think overall it's a total program deal. It goes all the way from the weight room. Our strength coach does a great job in the weight room that develops them physically. But there's a lot of um, toughness involved, mental toughness that they go through there. And, then, and I think we practice a lot different than a lot of people practice now. We practice old school. I mean, we go in full pads. We bang on each other. We beat on each other. And, and obviously, I think that develops it, too. And, and, I, and I agree with you. I, our team ran around pretty good last year and hit fairly good. And our team's running around better this year, and they're hitting better this year. But it's not where it's going to be someday. 20 forced fumbles already by San Diego State this year in six games. 20 forced fumbles. That's pretty impressive. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to follow up, that's a good question. I wanted to follow up because Ted and I talk about it sometimes during the broadcast, and this is kind of a general question for an old defensive head coach here, but is tackling a lost art? I know it's kind of a cliche. You know, people say, well, nobody tackles anymore, and nobody really knows how to wrap a guy up anymore. What's your take on that uh, particular angle? Uh, guys going for the big hit, the knockout blow, et cetera. Is that overstated that tackling is a lost art? You know, because, <laughs> right, right? You hear it a lot, right? No, no, I'm glad you asked that question because yeah. I'm an old-timer too. And, and uh, you know, when, when guys my age used to play, I, I think the game was uh, dirtier. <laughs> I think it was meaner. I think it was nastier. It wasn't near as skilled as it is now. And the, and the reason that the reason that tackling doesn't look as good as it used to look is because everybody ran tight formations and the tackling was in small areas. So you could go in and bang into a guy and miss the tackle and it was in such a small area there'd be two or three other guys coming to make the tackle. So the missed tackles were not near as obvious as they are now and it's because offenses have developed so well and they spread you from sideline to sideline. There's a lot of one-on-one -on -one tackles in the open field. And it takes a great athlete to be able to tackle another great athlete in open spaces. And so it doesn't happen very much. Yeah. If a great athlete gets the ball out in an open space, he's going to make that guy miss most of the time. And since it's out in the open spaces, that pursuit is so far away, it looks a whole lot worse than it used to look. So, so people are saying that, that kids aren't tackling as well as they used to. I beg to differ. They're being required to tackle in a whole different situations than the old guys used to that think that we were so good at it and we were so tough about it. They're, they're having to do a much more skilled assignment to tackle some great athlete out in the open field. So there's a lot more missed tackles. I have not heard one analyst talking about football, college or pro, mention anything about that what you just said right there but what you just said makes more sense than anything just about any of the rest of them have been saying for the last four or five years and that is that guys can still tackle it's just that when they miss one there's a they got to cover a lot more room right now to try and make a tackle as opposed to what they used to have to do they have to do it that, that skill is so much harder than it used to be it's it's ridiculous and, and people have gotten so much better at throwing and catching it that there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one deals out there in the open field. I, I'll tell you what, I was a DB for a long time. I'm sure glad I don't have to tackle all those guys out there in the open field. Well, let's be true. And you're right, I think, to also, Coach, I mean, there's offenses that set things up to maybe get you set up a play so that you can throw the ball to Ronnie Hillman, intentionally having him matched up against one guy out in space, that a guy that you're not even going to block because you're just going to say to Ronnie Hillman, you have to beat that guy. Because we can't let him tackle you man-on-man -man in open space like that. And, I, and other offenses are trying to do that to your defense. That, that's exactly true. They're, I mean, we're going to play Wyoming here, and it seems like a, a three weeks. But <laughs> we're going to play Wyoming. Wyoming has two wide receivers that when they catch the ball out there and they're one-on-one -on -one against a defensive back, they get tackled about two out of every ten times. Yeah. I mean, and, that, and, that's, and the pros are going, the pros are hard-headed because they like to do it the old way and they're going more and more and more you're starting to see more spread sets 
you're and, and guess what? They're not tackling quite as good anymore either when it's out there in the open spaces. Interesting things to keep in mind when the next time you see a tackle get missed. All right, next question for Coach Rocky Long. He uh, he informs us and uh, entertains us. Uh, I've learned so much about football from you this year, Coach. Thank you very much. All right, let's get the next question out here. Yeah, Coach, I, ha I have a question. Um, it seemed uh, I'd let, in the second half last uh, week, uh, last game, you, the defensive backs and linebackers did a great job of shutting down the run and the passing attack. Um, and it seemed like they got a handle on it. You said you changed some of the schemes. But my question is, we have two really, really good uh, defensive backs. You seem to be interchanging your safeties a lot more. But in, against Air Force, it seemed like in the second half, you started rotating in some other defensive backs for, for our two starters. Our, is the skill set of the, the backups getting better as the season progresses so that they are getting more time and you're trusting them more? Uh, I think that we trust uh, and believe we have six or seven safeties that can play and they alternate all the time. I think when Josh Wade got hurt in preseason, I, I think we thought we had three quality corners that could play against anybody. Josh Wade was one of them. Leon McFadden's the other and Larry Parker's the third. Um, when Josh went down in camp, uh, we have some freshmen, redshirt freshmen are the backups to Leon and Larry. So, so they don't play quite as much as, the, and you don't see them alternate as much as you do those safeties alternate. Um, they're getting better. Uh, we trust Leon and Larry a little bit more than we do the young ones right now. But the only way the young ones get better is to play. And so, so you'll see them in and out more often than you have in the past. And then we alternated, I think, about 30 guys on defense at Air Force because we chasing the wishbone down, you have to be fresh. And we were trying to keep fresh bodies in there. We played two or three fresh redshirt freshman defensive linemen that haven't played up until that game either. Yeah, they make it difficult on the guys in the broadcast booth to tell you who's actually out there making the tackles because... Uh, I know Ted has like three, uh, three man deep, four man deep. Ted Leitner does the play by play, and there's a couple guys making plays the other night against Air Force. So I don't even think we're on the three or the four man deep. We were looking them up, but uh, they were all coming through and helping you win that football game. All right, we got a couple of more questions for Coach Rocky Long. We'll do that in just a moment. Also, come back with our California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week. It's the Aztec Football Coaches Show. Chris Ello, along with the coach of the four and two Aztecs, Rocky Long. More to come from Hooli's Irish Pub and Grill on Learfield Sports and AM 600 Kogo. All right, we always finish strong in the Aztec Football Coaches Show. Let's hear you out there. We are live at Hooli's Irish Pub and Grill, also on AM 600 Kogo and the Internet. Thanks to Scott Horvath for getting us up there on the bird. Where are we being seen tonight, Scott? Anywhere else other than uh, the continental United States? Are we anywhere around the world tonight? Where's? Philippines? Philippines is as far as we're being seen tonight. Well, hi to everybody in the Philippines. Wish you were here with us in San Diego. Aztecs are back home a week from Saturday to take on Wyoming. And, of course, uh, we're here next Wednesday night at Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill. Want to take a moment before we we do. Uh, Polly, we got a couple of questions left for the uh, head coach uh, of the Aztecs, Rocky Long. All right, before we get to that, want to honor our California Bank and Trust uh, Student Athlete of the Week, California Bank and Trust. Always proud to recognize San Diego State's outstanding student athletes. This week's California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week is women's soccer player Sophie Metz. On October 20 or October 14th, rather, Sophie was named to the Soccer America Team of the Week for her outstanding performance against TCU and Texas. At TCU, Sophie uh, ended the Aztecs' 350-minute uh, scoring drought with a goal at the 317 mark. Two days later, she scored the game-winning goal against Texas. Always nice to beat the Longhorns, isn't it? In the 44th minute of play for the week, Sophie finished with two game-winning goals and an assist. The Soccer America Team of the Week honor was announced just two days after she was also named Mountain West Conference Player of the Week. So our California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week is women's soccer player Sophie Metz. Congratulations, Sophie. Nicely done. All right, back to uh, Coach Rocky Long. we got a few minutes left. Polly, with the uh, question of the day here for Coach Rocky Long from our live studio audience at Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill in Grossmont Center. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, Elo and Coach. Welcome to uh, San Diego. We're happy that you're here now. You. I hope you stay longer than the other coach that left. <laughs> um, What's the difference between the last coach and your coaching style for the kids now? Are they accepting the, your offense and your defense? And 
Do they listen to you? Did they listen to you better than they listen to Brady? I think was the que <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know if they listen to me any better than they did to Brady. <laughs> and um, since I worked for Brady, and Brady and I worked together at Oregon State, uh, we grew up with basically the same philosophy about how you run a football team, anyway. So there was very little change. Uh, I, I really think that we have a little bit different personalities. Uh, um, and we approach our players a little bit differently, but we believe in the same kind of offense. We believe in the same kind of defense. So none of that changed. And the way the program is run hasn't changed from the way Brady was running it. Uh, there might be a little bit different personality, but it, it, him and I were on the same page on almost everything. So nothing's really changed other than uh, he is a lot better looking and a lot bigger than I am. He is not better looking than you. I sat next to both of you now for two straight years, and I think you're right there. Both of you are fashionistas. <laughs> yeah, bo uh, both were, uh, we're both ugly. Bo <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you said it. I did not, but I disagree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, real quick, Coach, we've got a couple of minutes left. Final six games of the season. We'll talk a little bit more about it next week, but... Uh, do you break it down by you know, do, you, do you look at a couple games here a couple games there you got the big Boise State game on a schedule or is everything focused one deal Wyoming beat them first and then take it from there it's based on one game at a time I know that's coach and cliche but yeah. I don't think we did that with the TCU Air Force game I, I think we we did that we we planned for it and we coached for it as a two game series since those two games were so close together uh, now they're all spread out a week. Uh, we're going to play six straight weekends. Uh, Wyoming, as you've already said, is four and two. They're one and zero in conference. We're four and two and one and one in conference. Uh, they're a really good football team. That's a lot better football team than they were last year, and we had a lot of trouble with them last year. Uh, we don't worry about any other games until the Wyoming game's over. All right, well, that one's coming up next a week from Saturday. This Saturday, we all get the, uh, the weekend off. We can watch the rest of college football. Uh, did you guys, did you give your kids any time off at all, or are they back to work now, getting uh, kind of back in a regular groove, or will that just be next week where they have their kind of their regular practice schedule? No, we gave them a lot of time off. We gave a lot them of time off. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday off. And wow. Then, and then we practiced. They uh, got a good union, these players. No, <laughs> Negotiated I, I, a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, maybe so. Yeah, yeah I, I hadn't so. thought about it like that, but maybe so. Yeah. I better, I better crack that union. Crack, <laughs> crack right back now. On I mean, a little yeah. bit. All right, get him back to work, Coach Rocky Long. Let's hear it for the head coach of San Diego State, making it fun for us and teaching us all the football that you do, Coach. Every Wednesday night, it's been, it's been terrific. First half of the season on the Coach's Show, and, and I'm sure it'll be a terrific second half. We want to thank everybody who helped make the show possible today. Starting at the tip top with our buddy Craig, who runs Hooley's Irish Pub and Grill. Where is Craig tonight? Is he out? In a, he's right, right there in the front row. Hey, Craig, thanks again for having us. And all of the waiters and waitresses and bartenders and bar tabs, thanks to everybody here. Our on-site engineer is Kevin Boyle, the best in the business. Tiffany and Vince and our promotion staff, thanks a lot. Scott Horvath and his lovely wife, Polly for taking care of us on the internet. And back in the studio, my buddy Kevin Finnerty. For the coach, Rocky Long, Chris Sella, good night, everybody. The Aztec Coaches Show. See you next Wednesday from Learfield Sports and AM600 Kogo. Trivia time. What happened? <laughs> Kevin Boyle, the greatest... Uh, on-site engineer in history almost burned the house down. <laughs> well, thanks for coming again every uh, tonight, everybody. Uh, Jeff, we got a hat. Here it is. Uh, signed Aztec hat from Coach Rocky Long. Got to answer a, a little quick trivia question here for it. So uh, pay attention. Throw the question out at you, and I'll try to hear you sing out. And, get the hat in the hands of the right person. I think last week the person gave the wrong answer and I gave him the hat anyway. Wasn't that you? Um, San Diego State has beaten Wyoming 15 times in history. There are only three schools that the Aztecs have beaten more than that. You don't have to name all three. But which school has San Diego State beaten in football more than any other school? That is today's question. UNLV, no. Las Vegas, Cal Poly, no. Fresno State. I think, Coach, you said Fresno State, so you get your own hat. 
I know, you guys got it right here. Congratulations to these young, lovely ladies right up here in the front row. Fresno State, when of course our rivalry with Fresno State is continuing this season with the game of December. Thanks again for coming out. Make sure you take care of your wait staff for taking care of us tonight. And we'll see you next Wednesday night right back here at Hooley's. Thanks again.